Hello everybody and welcome to The Secret History Living Inside Your Aquarium. Today we have a really fun species spotlight. It's not one of the rarest fish, in fact it's one of the more common fish found in the Amazonian uh, waters. It's also found in the Guianan Shield and the uh, Orinoco uh, Upper Basin. And what's interesting about this fish that I'm about to release into the tank is that it's never been bred in captivity, reportedly, which is very strange because every other fish in this genus has. And so this fish, the one-lined pencil fish, reportedly has never been bred in captivity. So these fish are probably going to hide. That's because they like dimmer light, and unlike other pencil fish, they also do something that's a bit unusual, which is they hang out in the midwater. They hang out down in the midwater, all the way down to the bottom water. And that's not saying that they won't come to the top and hang out and eat bugs and algae and other things. But if you have a tank with pencil fish, they, they are one of the very few pencil fish that will venture down low. And in fact, if you've got plants, they'll hang out down low. So it's a good way to spread out the fish that are living in your tank if you've already got a bunch of fish that hang out in the open and on top or, you know, a big show fish. Um, now, these are a really interesting fish historically, and they were discovered quite a while ago by Western science, and that is in 1876 by a man with the name Stein Dackner, and he actually has discovered a whole lot of fish and, and given them their Latin names, including most of the rest of the pencil fish also uh, that were found early on in the 1800s. He also then passed off his research to Carl Eigenman, who is another well-known uh, ichthyologist that was based out of Indiana. And uh, then further, they, he, they were given a different name, but eventually they settled upon the name the Nanostomus una fasciata. And it's an interesting name in that the whole genus, Nanostomus, it means nana, nano or nanus for small in Greek, and then stoma, uh, mouth in Latin, uh, so, or actually switch that around, but it's a half Greek, half Latin uh, word, which is interesting, uh, considering it's a made up word, and they stuck it together that way. But let's talk about the care of these pencil fish, and uh, before we get to that, we'll talk a little bit about where they come from, which I mentioned is all over. But the kind of water that they like is generally acidic water, anything from neutral, which is the way they live in the wet season, all the way to very acidic, black, very tannic waters is the kind of water they like. And you can see, since I've released them from the bag they were in, they start to get kind of a little red nose and a little bit of iridescence on their body, and also some more red uh, throughout the tail and along that uh, lateral line. So to tell the males and females apart, that's a good cue because the anal fin as well as the lower caudal fin will be a little bit bigger on the males and they're also going to be slimmer than the females. So this is a good example right here of what the males would look like. See that color on the anal fin, the red and the black line that are starting to show up, as well as the iridescent blues hanging in there. So they're an interesting fish, being that they're pencil fish, for a number of reasons, but one is they hang out at this oblique angle that other fish are, other pencil fish are sometimes known to hang out at, but it's basically with their head up kind of at a 45 degree angle and their tail and body hanging down lower. And being that they are a fish that hangs out low to mid in the water, it's thought that it might be to mimic 
the angle that a lot of leaves on plants are at. So if you look here, uh, the growth pattern of a lot of leaves is at a slight angle upward. And so with the line on their side as uh, natural camouflage, it's thought that that might give them a little bit of protection. So these are a fish that live and die by the wet and dry season. And the wet and dry season throughout the Amazon, of course, is marked by the presence of water and lots and lots of rain and flooding out into a, a grassy savanna land uh, during the wet season, which is usually May through September, October, somewhere in there. And kind of uh, summer in the Northern Hemisphere is kind of the season when they are at their fullest and when they are known to spawn. And they spawn by laying eggs on the underside of leaves. Sometimes, actually, uh, it's been reported that they lay eggs all the way up on plants that are slightly out of the water or near the top of the water. So on floating plants or hanging vegetation. Uh, when the humidity is really high, um, which is kind of interesting because the splash tetra is one of the only other fish that seem to do that. Now, these guys will definitely be a bit of an enigma if you have a super planet tank like this one, but they're really good at eating algae that's floating around in the tank and also at eating any little uh, infusoria, uh, micro crustaceans like scuds or copepods, anything like that that's near your tank or in a terrarium, vivarium, they're going to love that. Now, their Latin name actually means small mouth, uh, or rather their <laughs> binomial nomenclature name. As I said, their Latin name is actually half Latin, half Greek. And then the rest of the name, the una uh, <laughs> lineatus, is going to mean one banded or one lined, which is uh, pretty apparent. Although, you know, you could argue that they have two black lines and one white line, <laughs> or two black lines and two white lines if you look at their belly. But regardless of this, they come in a, color, a couple different color morphs, and the ones collected from uh, Guiana and the northern part of their range, the northeastern part of their range, actually uh, the males and females are really hard to tell apart, and their uh, anal fin, the, the one that is uh, colorful right here with the red and the black on it, you can't tell it apart in the males and females, and it's actually really, really small on the northern population. Whereas if you go into southern the southern Amazonian population, you start to see that fin getting more and more colorful, sometimes with purples and blues. Uh, and here we can tell this is probably from the central range in that we see that its, uh, its paired fins have some blue in it and its anal fin has red and black with a little bit of iridescent blue in it. And we're zoomed in so much because this is a small little fish and it is uh, going to eat the algae that is those little spot size algae. It's probably not going to eat the diatome algae, but it will eat algae off of leaves as well as free floating algae, which is a nice little uh, feature for them to have in your tank. Now, one other really cool thing about them is that at night, they change colors. Now, these are new fish and they're a little bit stressed, so I wanna show you a different species just for a moment that does it very boldly. All right, so we're gonna turn the light on on these fish and you'll see that the ones that are near the back, these are Beckford pencil fish, that they have big uh, black solid lines on them. Whereas the ones that hang out not directly under the light, they actually get lines going the opposite direction on them. So you can see that here on this one, uh, if we can zoom in on it, they actually get lines going the other way. And that's thought, see the dark black on the tail and on the uh, middle and then on the forward part? That's thought to be because most pencil fish actually then go into shallower waters at night and it helps them actively camouflage whereas in the day 
they go out into the open water or you know two or three feet deep at least uh, a meter deep and they want to blend in with floating things like grass and debris that's floating and as a schooling fish the line helps them all kind of line up and and order whereas the nighttime arrangement which you see here on this one they're going to be hiding in the reeds so it's almost like tiger stripes and they get these bold markings but right before your eye as you're going to see right now they color up now the interesting thing about this and it's been reported in the nanostoma also uh or, or in the uh rather in the uh the one line pencil fish and here's another smaller little uh female where'd she go that had nighttime markings on her too because she's under the cover of all this floating debris let's get her back in the site right there see how discolored she is at night so then she'll color up again with that solid line and the red with the males being more red so check out my video on uh beckford pencil fish if you're curious about them but uh this fish is a pretty cool one and it's closely related with the nanostomus equus being the most closely related or that's the the fish known as the hockey stick uh, pencil fish so let's go back to them and finish talking about this little fish all right so I want to show you guys something really interesting now that we're coming back to this fish and it's decided to color up at just the perfect time because it's down at the bottom of the tank in the dark area, which let me show you the difference in light, it's actually used the same color trick that we saw more prominent on the other species of pencil fish, on the Beckford pencil fish. You can see it's starting to get lines, bars, little black dots developing horizontally. So let's take a look on the darkest part of the tank and see if we see any other of the fish and we do and here they're also starting to color up with the dark line as well as keeping their normal daytime pattern but I just find this really fascinating so beyond hanging out at an oblique angle most of the day and changing color the other thing that is really interesting about this fish is that it has never been successfully spawned in captivity that we know of that's been documented um, well in publications anywhere so it's kind of a unique fish in that respect because all the other pencil fish have been pretty easily bred these ones seem to have some different trigger that we just haven't figured out now if you know that that has changed and you know that for a fact that it wasn't the equus that was bred i'd absolutely love to hear about it uh, it seems like the Germans are always ahead in the hobby, and it wouldn't surprise me if somebody's done it uh, by now. But it was noted in the 1930s by William Innes that it's a beautiful fish, and it has something that no other fish can claim to have, and a trait which is rare, and that is class. So the way they move is just kind of like a hovering or a floating motion and they seem to just kind of drift which is really cool to see and it may be because during the dry season they hang out in the main channels of the Amazon basin and all the tributaries and they hang out in either grass or semi-flooded areas as long as possible until having to return to the deeper part of the river which then they actually hang out at less of an oblique angle when it's that time of year and it's been noted that they hang out more uh, level with the water level of uh, their, their black line so it's kind of cool the other neat thing is you could get the uh, the tetra species the little penguin tetras and they have this same marking but going up so it's basically black and then it goes up on the dorsal um, and t or rather on the tail fin or caudal fin and uh, rather than down whereas the black line here kind of looks like a hockey stick but I must say that these are not the hockey stick pencil fish that sometimes uh, gets they sometimes get called that that is the equus 
which people mistake. Now this is a really affordable pencil fish usually, and part of it's probably because they don't breed in captivity. Another part of it is that they hang out lower and that they are kind of hard to find sometimes in your own tank. But I think that they're a really fun addition in that it's kind of something fleeting that you just see them for a little while and ideally you want to keep them in a group of 10 or more. Now I only have five here but I also have three other species of pencil fish present and they can be compatible with other pencil fish. Now the other thing about them being that they live and die in the dry season is that they hang out in flooded marshes and savannas and flatlands whenever possible because that's where they spawn, that's where they have their babies. And they do that because the water's at its peak and the babies then spread out and they don't compete for resources. And there is no parental care uh, of the babies. But I just find them very charming, even though they don't care for their young. <laughs> and they have a really beautiful color when they're in black water tanks. So if you have a lot of tannins, wood, and leaves and things, their gold, silver, and uh, the, the iridescence of the blue on them really shimmers very brightly. And it kind of takes on almost like an uh, ember or uh, orange color as well with the water being like that. Now they also feature some interesting little movements and if you were to try to breed them most people say that it would be in a very dense tank with a low pH being that those flooded uh, plains that they hang out in have a pH all the way down to the high fours or the low fives and it's thought that that is when they spawn and in the thickest of the vegetation like I was saying and obviously they have an adaptation even during the day to have these markings now I'm filming this early in the morning and uh, I've noticed that whenever pencil fish get excited they shake their tail like that and they're often hunting or just showing off for the opposite sex. Now this happens to be a female. She's a little bit wider and we don't see any markings on her uh, anal fin there and her paired fins have a little bit of iridescence but no color to them really and that's how we can tell it's a female. So as far as who they get along with as tank mates, you know, they're not the best for a crowded community tank. If you're going to have a really busy community tank with tetras that are aggressive or that are rambunctious, but if you have thick cover in your tank, they're going to love being down in that. And also, if you have a community tank where you have a feature that's like a crebensis or a epistogramma or uh, rams, German rams, that is a great combination you could keep them with and they won't interfere or get scared, whereas they need to be able to forage, so having a lot of vegetation is very important so they can eat the little critters that live on the vegetation down at the bottom. That's where they will forage, being a mostly benthic little forager. But what's also nice is their mouths, given their genus name, is so small that they're not going to eat your adult shrimp. So they can be kept with shrimp, other nano fish like chili rasboras or um, ember tetras are all great fish if you wanted to do a nano community tank with them. So that's basically the rundown for these fish. They like being kept in water anywhere from 74 to 84 degrees, liking uh, and being more active on the warm end of things. And they will eat flake food, but they do love live food and a little bit of algae if they can get it. So I hope you enjoy checking out the little one-line pencil fish that have been a recent addition to my tank, as well as my other pencil fish. And uh, we'll check out the green pencil fish as well as the three-lined pencil fish soon as well, because they are tank mates with these little guys uh, in this tank. So I hope you guys have a great day. If you enjoyed this content, uh, liking it, sharing it, subscribing, all of those are great things that I uh, heavily appreciate. And I will see you next time 
on the secret history living in your aquarium, where we take deep dives into the critters in your aquarium, who discovered them in the Western and scientific world, and uh, all the little quirks about them that you miss on the other channels. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.